and welcome to Advanced Seed Starting. Today's instructor is going to be Karen Panter. She is in UW or UW. And Karen has been teaching at UW. You've been there for what, almost 20 years now? Almost 23. Almost 23 years. Specializes in commercial greenhouses, all, all things horticulture, annuals, perennials, trees, lawns, you name it, if it's green and growing, Karen can <laughs> help us. So today we're going to have her help us with advanced seed starting. So this is gonna be a little bit different than what your normal seed starting is. We've got one that needs some hot water treatment. We Most all of these are gonna need um, cold stratification. So they're gonna live in your refrigerator for a little while. Karen is going to take us on this journey of seed starting. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Karen Panter, and I'm also going to turn this around so she can see the class, hopefully. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> What's on the um, handout? So it's the, the handout is the one that I sent you earlier. Hopefully I sent you earlier. <laughs> no. I have the list of plant material, the seeds. And I have, actually, I have the seeds here too. I bought some of my own to play with. So the handout has got a few parts about cold stratification. Are there any questions about cold stratification? Sand, hot water, seeds are very small and they like to break dormancy. I have some seeds that look like hairy dust. So, I mean, I kid you not. And so we've got dwarf blue indigo, New Jersey tea, spotted bee balm, stiff goldenrod. I have this stiff goldenrod growing at my place, and it is like a bee magnet. The bees love it. A hairy beard tongue, pearly everlasting, furry violet, and showy goldenrod. I have Clustered poppy mellow and pink aster. Okay. So those are the seeds we're going to start. You can start all of them or the ones you just want to start. The choice is yours. They're all up there. Karen's going to take us through this journey of how to start seeds. So. Okay. Um, yeah, we, I have all of these. Um, Catherine sent me the list and so I went ahead and bought some, so I have them here as well. Um, and um, I can get them also. I have not gotten them started yet. Um, I thought I'd wait until at least today, maybe tomorrow and get them started. And then we can do a little comparison later in the summer as to how they have all done. Um, let me, one of the things that I teach over here is plant propagation um, every other spring. And it's coming up next spring, spring of 2022. And unfortunately, that's one that is does not lend itself to Zoom teaching via distance. And we found that out last time a year ago in uh, 2020 when midway through the class, all this COVID stuff happened and we ended up having to go completely online halfway through the course. And it was a challenge to say the least. But one of the things that we do talk about in there um, is we talk about all types of propagation, but one of the things we do discuss is some of the issues dealing with uh, seed propagation in particular. And so I think what I'm gonna do is go ahead and just show you a few of those slides, just to give you a little background. You have some information there um, about some of the strategies that we use to um, deal with some of our more particular seeds. Some are not fussy at all. And you just sow them and put them on the germination bench and away they go. Um, others require, um, different types of either stratification or scarification. Some require both. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different strategies involved. And so we'll talk about some of those. Um, I need to be able to share my screen, Catherine, for a few minutes.
there's just a few slides, but there's some background information that pertains to this that um, that are kind of help to explain some of the advanced techniques that we'll be talking about. And while Catherine is doing that, I will know that most of the issues that involve stratification, scarification, those types of strategies refer to perennials and they can be herbaceous or woody, either way. Oops, that's not the right one. Hang on. I got out of my, there it is. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, what I was just going to show you is uh, just a few slides. I'm not going to show you all 27 of them. We will look at this one, which you should have learned in beginning Master Gardener and requirements, just as a refresher. The seed has to be living. There have to be proper environmental conditions including moisture, the appropriate temperature for that particular species, an oxygen supply, and some seeds, but not all, require light. Some require darkness, some don't care. So you have to know the seed. Um, and then there is another thing here, and this is what we're actually talking about today, and that's some of the dormancy issues. And dormancy issues generally show Just to give you a brief idea of what the seed is doing as we uh, start to germinate it, they all go through this, these three phases. The first phase is imbibition, and that is where water is taken up by the seed. Nothing happens in a seed unless it is soaked completely with water first. Then there's another phase called this, the lag phase or phase two. And in this phase, you don't really see much going on with the seed, but the seed is incredibly metabolically active. There's little water uptake at this stage, but the seed is very, very, very active internally. The third phase is where we actually see that radical or that new root emerge and then the plant starts to take off and grow and develop very quickly after that. These phases are different time lengths depending on the species of seeds you're using. So that's why there's no time frame on this particular graph. Um, I think we'll just skip over that because we want to spend most of our time on the um, actual seeding. Um, and this is what happens in the imbibition phase a lot of water uptake, and then the lag phase where uh, the metabolic activity occurs. Um, don't worry about all that. The second phase is where there's a ton of physiological activity going on. Proteins are synthesized. Mitochondria mature, and what mitochondria do is uh, perform that function called respiration which is where um, metabolites are actually utilized in the plant. Some of the storage reserves are used, enzymes are produced and used. And the third phase is where we can actually see something happening again, and that is the radical protrusion. The first thing that will emerge from any seed, any seed, it doesn't matter, is the new root or, or the radical. Let's see, don't worry too much about that. What this shows you, and I can show you some different pictures, the different types of ways that certain seeds germinate. Some leave the seeds beneath the soil like corn does. Others like, uh, let's see, what have we got here? Peas uh, leave their um, seed below ground as well, but beans actually bring the seed up with them. So it's just different ways that the Seeds germinate, it's kind of characteristic. It really doesn't matter to us, it's just interesting. Epigeus and hypogeus is what those are called. 
um, epigeus where um, the cotyledons come above the ground, the seed does. And with hypogeus, they stay below ground. Just a little trivia there. And if you're thinking this is pretty advanced, yes, it is. <laughs> this is basically seed physiology and there are uh, people who make their living working with seeds constantly. It's actually a very rewarding part of horticulture and uh, agriculture in general. All right, there's a couple of different ways to measure germination. Um, we can usually when we talk about germination being complete is when we can actually see the seedling emerging from the media or the new shoot emerging. Um, some people call it when the radical is visible, um, but unless, if it's in the soil, uh, deep in the soil, you won't be able to see that. And we can measure germination by percentage, which is just the number of seeds out of a lot of say 100 actually germinate. The rate at which they germinate and how uniformly they germinate. So this would be however many a day rate would be. And then uniformity is how many actually germinate within say a five day span. So let's skip right over that. And we already know this, this is light is sometimes important. Oxygen is hugely important. The kicker is water and the appropriate temperatures. What slide are we on 17? Okay. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention to you um, in some types of water may be actually inhibitory to soil seed germination, especially if it's high in solvent, some of our well water and some of our surface water actually is. A lot of our municipal water supplies are not, um, but um, what happens is the, the seed can't take up water as it should because of excess salts in that water. And as a result, um, you get insufficient and very poor germination. So water quality is a big deal. There's also something called priming, which um, some seeds are actually primed and you may, may see some of these in horticultural circles. Um, what happens is the breeder or the seed producer, whatever company that might be, actually hydrates the seeds first, starts the germination process, and then stops it right before that radical emerges. And then they dry the seeds back down, package them, and then ship them to wherever they're supposed to go. And what that priming actually does is it um, increases the percent of germination. It also increases the rate of germination and also improves uniformity of germination. So priming is something, and you don't see it in all seeds, um, just some that may be a little difficult to, to germinate. Uh, let's see, we'll skip over that one. All right, the light sensitivity. Um, like I said, some plants, some seeds require um, light in order to germinate. And these are typically the smaller ones. Um, and we'll talk about that because some of the seeds that we're dealing with today are actually quite tiny. Um, and then the larger ones generally require darkness or it doesn't matter with them. So. Okay. This is the tough stuff right here. What we are going to do today is start the process of overcoming various types of what we call dormancy in seeds. Dormancy is a state where either something within the seed or on the covering or outside of the seed may be inhibiting the germination of that seed. So we have to figure out how to overcome that particular dormancy that that particular seed has. Quiescence is a different thing and that's, in, that's um, germination inhibited by the environment. Um, but dormancy is hugely important and that's basically what we're dealing with today. Germination that is inhibited by the seed's own anatomy or the seed's physiology. And there are primary dormancies and there are secondary dormancies. So you with me so far? Anybody got any questions yet?
Okay. Just jump right in if you have a question. All right. These are some of the concepts that some of the seeds that you have for today are going to exhibit. Primary exogenous. What does X mean? Outside. These are factors outside the embryo and everything relates to the embryo and seeds, especially dormancy. So primary exogenous, that's something outside of the embryo itself, type of dormancy. And there are a couple of these, exogenous physical. And in this case, it would be a hard seed coat and in order to overcome that hard seed coat, we can use a number of different methods to scarify the seed. So that's exogenous physical. It's actually a physical property of the seed that that outside coating is so thick that water can't penetrate unless it's abraded or broken or something or softened by hot water or sulfuric acid or whatever. So that's exogenous physical. And yes, there, I think we have some of those seeds today. If not, I have a few in back here I can show you. Scarify those types of seeds. All right. Exogenous, meaning outside the embryo. Chemical dormancy is a whole different thing. This is actual um, compounds in the seed, but outside of the embryo that inhibit seed germination. And these may um, be um, found in the fruit surrounding the seeds, seed covering tissues that inhibit germination and don't allow gas exchange to occur. So in this case, we have to, um, sometimes we have to just rinse the seeds off. Um, sometimes they require temperature in order to break down those particular chemicals that may be in the fruits that are inhibiting the seed from germinating. So you with me so far? Primary exogenous outside the embryo consisting of either physical or chemical. Guess what the next slide is going to be? Primary, any guesses? Endogenous. Endogenous. Good. This means that there is something within the embryo itself that is inhibiting germination. And in this case, there are a couple of different types. Uh, one is called morphological. And that means that the embryo simply is not fully developed when the seeds are uh, dispersed, they're not totally mature. And this is really common in the carrot family, the APAC. A lot of them, those types of seeds, that embryo has to continue to grow and develop a little bit after seeds have dispersed in order for the uh, seed to actually germinate. So that's morphological. Physiological is by far the most common type of dormancy there is. And this is an embryo that's physiologically not ready to germinate. There's something inside that embryo that is keeping it from germinating. It may require stratification, it may require light, um, and you just kind of have to either know the seed or have a good resource to tell you what type of um, stratification or methods you might use in order to germinate these types of seeds. But these are by far the most common. And stratification, which is usually a cold moist treatment, but not always, it can be a warm moist treatment as well. Um, just depends on the plant. So we've got our exogenous dormancies, physical and chemical, endogenous dormancies, morphological and physiological. And then it gets better. Double dormancy and secondary dormancy. Double dormancy is a combination of any two of the previous types of dormancy that we just talked about. And those are a little complicated to germinate. Um, and you have to get the order right. You have to go through one dormancy and break it before the other one can be broken. 
Secondary dormancy is a situation where the seeds don't germinate after primary dormancy is broken, they may go dormant again. And so we do run into those sorts of issues occasionally. Um, I haven't run into those myself, but uh, just to complicate things, double dormancy and secondary dormancy. And I'm going to stop there and see if there are questions. Did I lose you completely? Okay, good. Sometimes my students, I, I teach that class in this classroom right here. And sometimes it's interesting as you know, sometimes there's some blank stares and the exogenous, as long as you can remember exogenous outside the embryo and endogenous within the embryo, you can try to figure out what type of dormancy they have. For many of our plant species that are commonly grown, we know what those dormancies are and we know how to deal with them. Um, for some of the unknowns, a lot of the natives that we have, um, we don't know exactly what the triggers are for uh, proper seed germination. And some of them just defy seed propagation completely. And we have to find other ways in order to propagate them, such as cuttings or layering or any other of the various methods of propagation that we have at our disposal. Any questions yet? Okay, great. Um, I think what I'm going to do is show you a few of the materials that you can use and just talk real well. And I know what I'm going to do here. Hang on. We'll go to the other slide set, which is not that one, it's that one. There's just a few slides I wanted to show you about. And these are from the propagation textbook that we use and I'll show you the resources I use here in a few minutes. And then we'll get into the actual seeds themselves. This is a large file. There we go. All right, just to show you a few things. Um, this is the basic structure of a seed. Um, pretty straightforward. Most of them have these uh, components, the seed coat, the embryo itself, and then the cotyledons. And this is the rudimentary, rudimentary uh, root there. Let's see, we've already talked about those. And these are way beyond anything we need to talk about in here. Um, this is just kind of an interesting set of photos, the radical emerging uh, from a petunia seed, which are actually quite small um, and a little tricky to germinate. They're um, expensive for one thing, they're all um, F1 hybrids. And this is the hypogeus and epigeus germination again, where the seed either stays below ground or comes up with the, with the uh, new shoot. Let's see. All right, that's all I wanted to show you in that one. So we will stop sharing right there. Okay, um, a couple of other things I wanted to show you are some of the basics. And then I am going to actually show you in our greenhouse, the facilities that we use here for germinating seeds, just to give you an idea of what we have here. And it, you don't have to have a misbench. You don't have to have a mistiming mechanism, um, you, but that's what we have here. And so I wanted to show you that. And I also have a uh, heat mat that I wanted to show you as well. And that has actually come in very handy for germinating the numbers of seeds that I do, which is quite a few in the spring. As far as germinating the seeds and what to put them in, I use a lot of these. These are what are called plug trays. Um, and this happens to be a uh, 128. There are eight across by 16 
down the length of it, individual cells. And when this is filled with media, each of the individual cells then gets a seed. And it's a real easy way to have one plant per cell. It reduces transplant issues later on. And you can actually get these in a number of sizes. This has got 128 um, cells in it. This larger one is a little better for woody plants, rooting cuttings and that kind of things. This is a 72, it's a six by 12. And uh, they're both 11 by 22 and they will fit into a regular 11 by 22 flat if you need something else to support these or if you're carrying them around to any extent. I use a lot of these. Um, I mostly use the 128s, but I have used these on occasion, the 72s for rooting cuttings and things like that, that we occasionally get to do. You can use anything as long as it's two things, clean and has drainage in the bottom. Um, anything that you get um, from a commercial um, operation or a nursery or greenhouse supplier will have uh, drainage in it, although you can request flats and things that don't have drainage, but we always go for drainage. It's, uh, otherwise they end up floating and you end up rotting your seeds, which is not what you want. Um, so as long as it's clean and has drainage, you can use virtually anything to germinate seeds. In order to um, use a good medium, however, that is the next really important component. And the medium that I use is, this is one brand, but this is um, a professional germinating mix, but anybody can get this. A lot of times you can find this kind of thing at a, one of the larger garden centers. This is a Berger mix, but there's a number of different about them is a they're clean out of the bag so you don't have to sterilize and they are also very lightweight and very fine there are pieces of perlite and peat moss in here that's basically all it is but they're milled to a fine level so that um, the, the particles are quite small. And so that's what we prefer for seeds. What you don't want for germinating seeds is anything that's got native soil in it. And that sounds, <laughs> especially when you're dealing with native plants, you think, oh, well, shouldn't we use native soil? No, you shouldn't. The reason is, A, it's way too heavy. It holds too much water. It's got weed seeds in it. It's got pathogens in it. It's got insects in it. If you want to be successful in germinating seeds, you want to get rid of all those things and use a good clean mix. You will have far superior results if you use a good germination mix that does not contain native soil and doesn't also contain any bark or large particles. The reason for the large particles not being in there is your seeds get lost. And if you're using small seeds, it's very easy to lose them. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes here. So those are some of the suggestions and recommendations that we have um, for anybody, backyard gardener or professional propagator, um, either way um, to get be more successful at germinating their seeds. Questions on any of that? I have a question. Um, if you have trays and want to reuse them, how do you clean it? Do you use Clorox or just soap? Good question. Water? Yes, you can reuse um, seed trays like these. And what we suggest is if you have a tub that will fit, you can also cut these to any size you want, and you, which I have done. I do that all the time, actually. And then they're easy, a little easier to clean. But I always dunk these in a uh, utility sink or some kind of a tub in a 10% bleach solution and leave them in there for um, 15 to 30 minutes and then pull them out and let them air dry. And uh, that will help to eliminate most of the pathogens, et cetera. You don't wanna have to scrub them because you'll never get everything out. And that's another reason for using a real good um, peat moss and perlite based germination mix is that they're real easy to clean <laughs> um, later on. So, but yeah, that's, yes, you can reuse them. 
we use either clean or new everything. Clean or new, I use new labels all the time. I don't ever, it's hard to reuse labels just because you write all over them and it's a real pain. Um, clean or new growing mix, uh, clean or new virtually everything. So, but a 10% bleach solution will work. There's also a couple of products out there that you can also use. One is called Green Shield, which is a greenhouse disinfectant that you can use on any surface basically. Um, and then there's another one, um, Zero Tall, which is a um, basically peroxide. Anything like that will also work. Anything else? Okay. Well, let me um, get my iPad fired up here and I will take you on a short tour of our greenhouse. Has anybody been, I, I know Catherine's been over here. I don't know if anybody else has been to our greenhouse facility here. Okay, a few people, all right. All right. Okay, with any luck, this will cooperate very easily. So the next time I have to run out for your call, do you need to make her a host? So, um, for a phone call, yeah. No. There we go. Am I unmuted yet? Yep, you're we can okay. hear you now. Okay. Um, this is our head house, which has in it the uh, bunch of offices and laboratories. And we also have the boilers are in this section of the building. Um, we have six greenhouses that um, kind of stretch out. You can sort of see uh, through there this one. And each of these six sections has three individual units within it. We have depending on who you talk to, anywhere between 12 and 15,000 square feet of greenhouse space, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. That's not even half an acre. That's pretty little, so. But we do keep it full. And what I'm going to show you is our propagation unit, uh, which is down the road here. Um, I may take you outside briefly here for a second and show you. For those of you who are not familiar with this operation, we have the RO system, reverse osmosis water system, which is very noisy. That's it there. Um, and it is fed into each of the individual greenhouse sections. So not only the labs, but also the greenhouse sections all have access to reverse osmosis water, which is really helpful. The space you see out there with the high tunnels on it, that is our student farm. They have five smaller tunnels and then the longer uh, one right there. And they're just gearing up for getting everything planted out there. And we have some irrigated space out here for research purposes. So water's going today. And then on the south side, which I'll show you later, um, we also have some other irrigated areas where my other stuff is, my high tunnels and my raised beds. This is the greenhouse that's used for agroecology class. So these are all their plant materials. And this greenhouse is our Propagation house. Um, it has a 
uh, timer on it that is actually run by solar power. We can run it um, either on just basic time or by solar radiation. And the nice thing about the solar radiation is that it shuts off at night on its own, which is great. And then it comes back on in the morning as light increases. And it also kind of self-regulates as if it's a cloudy day, it doesn't come on as often. If it's a sunny day like today, um, it's coming on <laughs> every few minutes. So, and then we have the mist nozzles in here and there's a whole row of them down there. We have two of these benches. So it's not running right now. The other thing that I wanted to show you is the thermostat that runs the heat mat. This particular thermostat has four outlets on it, so you can run four maps. Uh, and you can change the temperature. It's now set at 78 degrees, which is what I have it for germinating my stuff. And then this is the actual heat mat. It's upside down. But, uh, this is what I use. It's already, I have four of these. Uh, and they're awesome. They just plug into the thermostat that I just showed you and you lay them out and put your mat on top and uh, off you go. So we have two systems like this. There's a third one in a different greenhouse. Um, and you can do, uh, you know, of course, in a perfect world, we all would have access to a propagation bench like these. Um, but you don't have to have this. All you need is a place that you can keep, keep high humidity by using some type of a plastic cover, some way to mist or provide watering for your seeds or cuttings or whatever it is you're germinating. Um, and then adequate temperature, which in most cases, and these are not expensive. Um, you'd have to look on like Phyto. The company that produces it is Phytotronics. And it's very noisy and very hot in here, so I'm going to go in the other <laughs> out in the hallway. We have all sorts of the fans are operating full blast today because it is so miserably hot. I'm sure you're even hotter. It's 90 plus over here in there. And I'll ask for questions when I get in the hallway where it's a little quieter. <laughs> Not a lot, but a little. Greenhouses are pretty noisy. Yeah. Okay, questions, comments. So Karen, on your propagation beds, are you just using heat mats, is that all? Yes, that's all I use. Sometimes we don't even use those. It kind of depends on the project, but yeah. What kind of grasses are you growing in there? I'm sorry? What kind of grasses are you growing in that first room? What kind of grass are, oh, those are various types. I'm sorry, um, I get what you're saying. Those are, let me turn the camera around again. There we go. Um, those are various types. There's wheat grasses, there's buffalo, there's oats, there's um, barley, there's, I don't even know what kind of, there's all sorts of them in here for teaching purposes for Agroecology 1000 class over here. It's our introductory sustainable agriculture course. Clover, happily blooming. Uh, looks like we got some oats and all sorts of fun things in here. The only one that I can actually pick out myself, I'm not very good at grasses, um, is buffalo, uh, but it has to be See if I can find the buffalo. Oh, yeah, right here. <laughs> this is buffalo grass right here. Um, the only way I can tell is that it has the above ground stolons. And it's got curly foliage too. It's just a real pretty grass. So this is buffalo. That's the only one I could tell for sure. The rest of them, I would have to get my key out and try to figure it out. Other questions? Was that question? No, that was a comment, Karen. I, oh, okay. I have several books on grass identification. Oh, it's, I, it's hard. 
you have to have a microscope. And there's a lot of little things like ligules and ons and um, sheaths and venation and all this other stuff that is very crucial to identifying grasses properly. And I never learned how to do it very well. I know what they all are, but it is just real difficult. Some people have the ability to look at them like Chris Hildred and just say, oh, that's whatever grass it is. I haven't done that. Um, I just wanted to show you my greenhouse, which is pretty empty at the moment. <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was completely full. And then out back here, my two high tunnels and my raised beds. So the raised beds, three of them are empty, except for a few thistle plants and some thyme. And the high tunnels basically are just holding things for now. We're not really got any projects going on this summer because they're both gonna get recovered. As soon as we get the plant material out of there, I'm gonna yank off the old covers and redo them. So. And so this is the rest of our facility. So, and then the greenhouses. All right, let's go back and talk seeds. And we have had class, uh, there's another one of my uh, rolled up Wheat mats, there's three, two more in the boxes there. So we use those all the time. Just a minute, I can't hear a thing in here. <laughs> all the fans are running. This place is like a vacuum, the doors get sucked in, you can't open them. Okay, question. Okay, so when we were in your little greenhouse area, you had some yellow things hanging down. Do you want to talk about those? And what the yellow things? Yeah, you had some look like yellow sticky traps hanging down. There are some sticky traps in there. I'm not sure they're yellow. Or they are yellow. Um, those are probably sticky traps. I'll show you the ones in here. They're on the bench. This isn't my house, but this is probably what you're talking about. The sticky trap right there. And I do have a few in my house. I also have a red uh, burner in there that hangs from the ceiling. And that is to vaporize sulfur powder, which is a wonderful fungicide and keeps powdery mildew at bay. It's wonderful. Put it on a timer. It vaporizes it at night when no one's in there, and it effectively annihilates powdery mildew. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so now you've seen the place, or most of it. This this hallway is basically a bowling alley. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close this computer down and. Oops. I know from experience that we get a lot of feedback if I'm using both of them. So I've done classes this way. I've done tours of greenhouses. What I use as my uh, Wi-Fi source is my little portable point here. I can go you know, almost anywhere with it. It's great and use my iPad to show people all sorts of fun stuff. So, okay. All right. Do you want to take a break before we get into so the seeds themselves? So I want to spend the, the rest of the time. We have about another hour on uh, the actual seeds. I think everybody's good to go. You're good? To, okay. Sounds good. If they're not, they can get up and they know where the bathroom <laughs> Yeah, feel free. You won't bother. I'm, I'm used to a lot of interruption students asking questions and up and down and in and out. So it's not a big deal. No. I have a question. Go ahead. When you have the seed mix, seed soil mix, that's not right. 
germination mix, <laughs> sterilized stuff. Does it go bad or does it unsterilize itself over time? No, not as long as you don't use um, anything that's not clean to get the mix out. Make sure your hands are clean or whatever you're scooping the media out with has to be clean as well. And when you're done with it and you haven't used the whole bag, just roll it up and make sure it's securely um, tight so it doesn't dry out too much. And uh, as long as it's, the bag is closed, it should be fine. I haven't run it. I use a ton of media around here. I've got a pallet of it sitting in the behind my greenhouse. It's not the germination mix, it's other stuff, but um, it does not go bad, no. Anything else? Okay. All right, well, I wanted to show you some of the resources that I use when I don't know about a particular plant and how to germinate its seeds. I have some resources that are my go-tos. There's three of them. Um, well, actually four. One is the seed company that you get your seeds from. The nice thing about um, Prairie Moon, which is where I got, I'm guessing that may be where you got yours, Catherine. Yep. Um, <laughs> they popped up right away as soon as I started typing all these names in. They Prairie Moon was tops on the Google list. Uh, but the nice thing about these is that they do provide the germination information on the package. So for this one, which is the Baptisia, um, you do need to know what the um, codes mean, but this is seeds germinate after 10 days of cold moist stratification. So what I'll do is I'll show you how to actually get the seeds into a cold moist stratification and how we actually accomplish that. Um, and that's your first resource is usually the seed company. The seed company information, however, for the, they were out of, um, Prairie Moon was out of the Pearly Everlasting, so I got it from a different company called Northwest Native Seed, but there are no instructions with it. So I had to look up Pearly Everlasting and try to figure out how to germinate the Pearly Everlasting seeds. So your first resource is often your seed company. And there's a number of them out there, not only the ones, those two that I just showed you, but there's one, in, there's several in Colorado. There's a couple in Wyoming. Um, and most of the time they will provide information on how to germinate the products that they sell. There is another terrific reference that I use constantly, and that is this ball culture guide. Um, this is, and you, anybody can buy it. It's from the Ball Publishing Company in West Chicago, Illinois. Um, and it is a terrific resource. It's easy to read. It includes, it doesn't include everything. There are no woody plants in here. But if you are growing annual flowering plants, vegetables, herbs, um, a few perennials, some cut flowers, there are instructions here on a good chunk of the ones that we grow on a routine basis, how to germinate the seeds. And in this book, I found the Baptisia. There was some information in it. It may not be the specific species, but the genus is in here. And so this is a reference that I just, I wore out my previous copy. This is actually a revised edition and it's, it's, it's just fantastic. I love this thing. So the ball culture guide is a real good resource. Another one that anybody can buy, and this is strictly woody plants. This has no herbaceous stuff in it at all. This is my Bible for woody plants. This is the manual of woody landscape plants. And I believe there's a new version out, um, although I don't have it yet. <laughs> he also, the author, Michael Durr, uh, D-I-R-R, has also put out a book on um, landscape trees and shrubs that is fantastic. Unfortunately, it's hard to cover and it weighs probably 20 pounds. This thing's bad enough, but it's a <laughs> hefty volume and it's already taped. I've used it so much. Um, but this will actually include propagation information in it on woody plants. And it includes not only seeds, but also ways to uh, propagate some using cuttings and that sort of thing. So this is Aaron, a who's the author? 
Michael Durr, D-I-R-R. -R. Thank you. Anyone else yellow orange? Michael Durr, I think he's retired now, but he was faculty at the University of Georgia for many, many, many years. And he is the tree guy. He knows every tree, I think, on the planet. He's just a fantastic, he's an encyclopedia. <laughs> fantastic guy. The third reference I wanted to show you, um, and this one is one of the, is the text we actually use in plant propagation class. And this thing, the other two are relatively um, reasonably priced and readily available. This one is also readily available, but it's also, very expensive, but you can also buy a, a earlier version of it. But this is the textbook we use. It's called um, Hartman and Kester's Plant Propagation. And this is the eighth edition. The ninth one is out as well. I have that in my office too. But this in the back of it includes um, different sections on different types of plants and how to propagate them, including from seeds. And so this is another one of my go-tos, this plant propagation textbook. And this is from Pearson uh, Prentice Hall. You can find used um, copies or earlier versions of this book, probably through Amazon and a number of other sources, but uh, it's also a really good book. Plus it's got all the great propagation methods in it, uh, which is fantastic. So. All right. Well, um, I will start off here with the, let's see, do you want to start with anything in particular or should I just go in Latin name alphabetical order? <laughs> Some of the principles will apply to several of these different types of seeds. Right. Let's open, I'm opening the Pearly Everlasting, which is Anaphyllis. Uh, Anaphallus margaritacea. And, oh boy, this is going to be a fun one. The seeds are very messy. <laughs> I can tell there's a lot of fluff with them. They look like there's a lot of cotton in this particular batch. Does one of you, do you all have this one as well? I don't remember all that fluff being in there. Yeah, these um, and different seed companies have different ideas on cleaning seeds. Some clean everything. Some this would be impossible to clean. The seeds are also quite small. So with this one, the instructions that I found. So Karen, ours came in a little package. Oh, okay, yeah, we've got clean. the package. Yeah, okay. they're clean. Okay, they're the, okay. Tiny. They are. Yep. Okay, so these actually say the instructions that I found, and I don't know what it says on your Prairie Moon packet, but it says no treatment, no covering. The seeds are tiny, you don't wanna cover them. They don't need stratification and they don't need scarification. Yay, because <laughs> these would be really, really difficult to do any of the above with. So the ones from Prairie Moon say you need 30 days of cold stratification. And so this is the other problem I've been running into, Karen, is that there's, everyone has a different opinion on how to get right. this started. Exactly, yes. The information I got was from um, one of the seed companies online. I'm trying to remember which one now. I didn't write it down, unfortunately. Um, if you want to make sure, what you can do is cold, moist treatment for 30 days at 40 degrees, just in your refrigerator. Your fridge, your fridge should be about 40 degrees, which is perfect for cold stratification. <laughs> you don't want to freeze them. You just want them cold. You also want them moist. So what you want to do, and I remembered to bring a little Ziploc snack bag. <laughs> These are perfect for seeds like this. What I would do in this case, in order to stratify them, actually the first thing I'm going to write, do is write on the bag, the date, label everything. 
And I mean everything because you won't remember. <laughs> so today's date is the 15th, 6 15, 21. That's on the bag. Well, I can't read it, but there it is. Um, and then I'm also, one way, the easiest way to do this, if you don't have a lot of space, is to use some of your germination mix that you just bought from your favorite garden center, put it in the bag, the little Ziploc bag. It doesn't take much, especially for tiny seeds like this pearly everlasting. Just put a small amount in your bag and then you're gonna wanna put in your seeds. And I will attempt to do this. We'll see how this works. All the fuzz and everything else. There's supposed to be a hundred seeds in here. There we go. Came out all in one kind of a large mass. They're all stuck together. So that's what it looks like inside the bag. I'm gonna zip it closed and try to mix it up a little bit just to distribute the seeds a little more evenly. Got germinating mix on my computer. Oh well. <laughs> All right. Then what's the next thing that you're gonna do? What what has this this can go in the refrigerator, but what has to be done first? What's that? Water. water. It needs to be moistened, yes. And so I, the water is way over yonder, so I'll be right back here. Tell us what happens to the plant cells. Okay. And unfortunately, the germination mix is a little dry, and so it's going to take some time for it. Peat moss, as you know, doesn't re-wet very easily at all whatsoever. Um, and so it's pretty moist evenly in there. And I would not close it completely. And the reason for that is that you've got to get oxygen. The seeds are going to need some oxygen. They're still living things in here, even though they're wet. And yes, a clamshell will work. That works great, as long as it doesn't have too many holes in the bottom. The next thing I'm going to do that has been moistened, and the reason for the moistening is that the seeds will not register the cold temperatures or warm temperatures for that matter if they're dry. Do you remember when you were a kid, my mom did this all the time because I was constantly, me and my brother were constantly bumping our heads. She would take an ice cube and put it inside a washcloth and then she would moisten the washcloth. Try that at home, use two washcloths, an ice cube in each one Leave one dry and one moist, and then put them both on your forehead and see what the difference is as far as temperature that you can feel. It has to be moist in order for those seeds and your forehead to feel the cold. So that's why the moisture is crucial. Nothing is going to happen unless they are moist. The other thing I do for um, insurance purposes is take a label and I go through plant labels like there's no tomorrow. And I would put on here, these, these are clean. I would put on here the uh, Latin name. I have to remember how to spell it. Today's date, 6, 15, 21. And where am I gonna put that? Inside the bag. Inside the bag, yes. and then we're ready to go. So this will be in the cooler for 30 days. The one instructions I had said it didn't need stratification, but the information from Prairie Moon said, yes, stratify them. So we will stratify them and see what happens. When the 30 days is up, all I'll have to do is take this uh, moist media amount containing the seeds, 
and it should be checked periodically to make sure it's either not too wet or too dry. Um, and then it just needs to be spread out on the top of a container, um, whatever you're using to germinate seeds. Doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't need a lot of depth to it. Um, you can germinate seeds in half an inch or an inch of growing mix. Um, and then we would go from there and see what kind of germination we get. Theoretically, there's a hundred seeds in here. So. Questions on cold stratification and how to get that accomplished and tiny seeds like these that were a real mess with all that cotton. So during that time period, do you ever have to add any more water? You might have to, yeah. And that's make sure too that it's not staying too wet. Um, that and you you can do that in two ways. You can either leave the bag open a little bit, or you can take like a, a hole puncher, paper hole puncher, and just punch a couple holes in it. And that will help to um, allow air movement in and out. And but it may dry out a little bit too. So yes, you may need to add some. Anything else? I'll show you what we use for that. Okay. I probably don't have anything nearly as sophisticated as you have. <laughs> Not sophisticated. I have a coffee filter <laughs> and a sieve. Now, there are some seeds and this is that's a stratification or scarification method the hot water i use my coffee maker and put a filter in the top of it and make a pot of hot water with my coffee maker and that's the hot water source and then in order to screen out the seeds i just use one of these little sieves i have no idea where i bought these i've got three or four of these they're perfect size and you just pour the water uh, through it and leaving the seeds behind inside the sieve. This is really low tech, but it works. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like a like a little tea bag. Well, the holes are smaller though. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the times the seeds that you're gonna be doing this type of scarification with are large anyway, so you're not gonna lose them. So. But yeah, the hot water is um, one way to scarify things like the, the poppy mallow. Um, and it says either cold moist at 60 days or hot water. So you can either use a cold treatment or a little bit tr uh, quicker hot water treatment. And then what you do is you let the, you pour the hot water on the seeds, let them sit for 24 hours and then drain them and rinse them. And another way to do that is using sulfuric acid, which is not recommended for the novice because sulfuric acid is nasty stuff. Um, but some types of seeds benefit from a, just even a 15 minute sulfuric acid soak, which softens up the seed coat enough. It's another scarification strategy um, that you can use for those that have uh, real hard seed coats. But again, I wouldn't recommend you just go out and do that because acids are really difficult to work with. That help? The other thing that you can do for scarification, and I don't know that any of these seeds are big enough to actually do this. Um, I've got some seeds in back that are a little easier. Sandpaper. <laughs> just get some used sandpaper. This is a hunk that my husband has played with for however many pieces of furniture. And you can put your seeds on there and then just rub them gently to abrade the seed coat. All you, you don't want to mess it up. You don't want to do this very long because you'll end up killing the seed. You just want to get enough of that seed coat um, abraded so that water can actually get into the seed to start the germination product project uh, process. So just an old piece of Sandpaper will help too. And this is another way to scarify your seeds. So you can use sandpaper. 
You can use a knife if the seeds are large enough and just nick the seeds once or twice. Um, you can use hot water. Um, there's any number of ways to scarify seeds. And it's, you, it's easy to keep straight because the scarify, S-C-A-R, you're actually scarring the seeds. You're damaging it so that you can allow water inside of it. Okay, that's the idea behind scarification. Questions? What's that? It said medium grit. This is a medium. This one is, I don't know if there's a number on it anymore. This is a hundred grit, which is, is fairly fine. It's not, I'm not sure I'd use anything too, too coarse on, on seeds. Yeah, I've got 220 grit. But if so this this would work if you've got you know some old sandpaper hanging around. Some people use rock tumblers um, that has sandpaper inside. Just very brief amount of time just to abrade the outside of the seeds. Um, there's a number of ways to scarify. Can get a little tedious if you've got a lot of seeds. <laughs> How do you suppose um, coconuts? do their thing and are allowed and how, how does a coconut end up getting water inside of it so it can germinate a coconut is the largest seed we know of what's that floating around in the ocean um the salt water might drop allow some water in there yeah how, uh, how tall are coconut palms? Yeah, they're, they're fairly tall. And, and so when they drop, they crack themselves frequently and that's how they end up allowing water inside. Um, in many places in, in Hawaii, for example, they don't allow the coconuts to develop. They take them all off the, the trees. They're not actually trees. Um, but they remove them because they are so hard and when they fall, they have been known to kill people. So you, you won't see a coconut on a, on a coconut palm in Hawaii. All right, let's see, cold, moist, and day. All right, the next one I've got here is the uh, Baptisia, which is a wonderful plant. We have some in my backyard. It's up, but it has not blooming yet. Um, but this is the Baptisia australis. And this one, Prairie Moon suggests cold, moist treatment for only 10 days, which isn't very long. Um, and the other information I found um, suggested three weeks with an overnight soak first. And this is from the ball um, culture guide, that first book I showed you. So that here again, there's differing opinions on what to do with these. So these are not, let's open a package and see how big the seeds are. My thinking is to go with what Prairie Moon suggests and to cold stratify them for 10 days. I might go three weeks and kind of compromise. Oh, the seeds are actually fairly large. The legumes, which this one is, generally have a little bit larger seeds and they are notorious for having um, thick seed coats. And so that's why they suggest a hot water soak in the ball <clears throat> culture guidebook. And then I would do a cold moist treatment for three weeks. 10 days to three weeks, depending on what, what your schedule is like. So Karen, I do have a question for you. This is um, my second class on doing seed starting. In the first class, they had some comments about the seeds germinated, but kind of stalled out. Mm -hmm. They radically came out, cow leaves popped out, first true leaves, and then they stopped. Usually it's light, inadequate light. Okay. So as soon as you see anything green emerging from your germination mix, 
get them to higher light. Otherwise they will stop. You can also stop um, or cut back on watering. A lot of times they stay too wet, but usually the, especially in a home when you're trying to germinate seeds and you don't have a greenhouse, um, usually the limiting factor is light. So as soon as they start to germinate and you see green stuff poking up out of that mix, get them into a higher light source closer to a window, uh, a fluorescent light, a grow light, anything. But they need that light, otherwise they will just sit. And that happens a lot. That's a complaint I get a lot. This year, um, I got a question just last week, as a matter of fact, about cucumbers doing exactly that. They would germinate and then they would just sit. <laughs> and the thing about, and you also have to know um, what's appropriate for <clears throat> the particular seed, the temperatures that they prefer to germinate at. Cucumbers prefer everything warm. The, the growing mix should be you know, fairly warm, 60, 65 degrees, air temperature the same. Um, they really will not germinate well and they will not thrive unless there is warm temperatures and very high light. And as a result of our cool, moist spring, a lot of cucumber seeds were germinating and then just sitting. And of course, in certain places, a lot of the cukes and squash and things like that are, are direct sown outdoors. Um, but if the soil's too cold and it's too wet, they will just sit. Outdoors, the light is not an issue, but indoors, light is almost always the limiting factor. Anything else? Well, are you all ready to start starting the seeds? So are there any, any others you want me to go over? Um, there's one that's the Jersey tea, the Ceanothus scarification using sandpaper is their recommendation. Um, the bee balm Monarda should need no treatment at all. And that's from a diff couple of different sources. The goldenrod will take 60 days in your refrigerator, cold moist stratification. So whoever's doing that one, it's gonna take a while. Um, same with the Penstemon. Solidago, that's a very small seed, needs light, requires light, it will not be covered. If you cover it, it will not germinate. Uh, Karen, for the ones yeah. that the light, I thought just putting some seed mix, the uh, germination mix in a clamshell. Uh-huh. And just, yep. Mini yep. greenhouse. Yep. So what there you go. And that works. Yeah, the clamshells are readily available. Um, let's see. The aster, the symphiotrichum, also requires light, very small seeds. And uh, the viola, cold moist, 60 days. So there's several that require cold moist 60 day treatments. And uh, so those, you're, you won't see any results probably until September, October. And remember too, that once you get the seeds treated, that's one thing, then you have to get them into their proper germination temperatures and light situations in order for the germination process to start. So the scarification and stratification is just the first step. Then we go to the germination step and then the third step is the growing on. And each of those requires a different set of light, temperature, moisture, et cetera. So. This is just the beginning of the whole process. So yeah, if you wanna go ahead and um, sow some seeds and get them started at least and put it and then know what um, stratification or scarification treatment they're gonna need. And I can help answer questions here. I'm gonna do these all myself too, so we can compare notes. <laughs> oh, fun. <laughs> this is so much fun. Propagation using seeds is just a hoot. I, it's just, it's great. It's, it's so much fun just to, A, open the packages just to see what's inside, you know, and uh, then they're just so much fun to, to watch the green growing things. It's just amazing. These little tiny things that you look like dust in many cases, like orchid seeds are dusty, 
Um, but yet they produce these wonderful plants for us. It's terrific. So I just think they're fascinating. Okay. So yeah, go ahead, Catherine. I'll just kind of watch and listen while you're. Okay, so I'm going to turn this just ever so slightly. And all right, there's my seed starting. There you go. And like so. The next phase of this is you guys get to actually get the seeds and follow the guide for what it needs. So some of these seeds have the hot water poured over them. And my suggestion is to use the filter because my little sieve can be here forever trying to get the seeds out. So here's the sieve. Put your um, filter down, put your seeds in the filter, and then pour the boiling water thusly and then pop it into a Ziploc bag. I have plenty of Ziploc bags. I have lots of clamshells. I have the sandpaper for the ones that need sandpaper. You can do all of the seeds or you can pick and choose which ones you want to start. But come on up. And all the information that's on the packets are on here. Right? Yeah, yeah. And like Karen said, um, put a date on here and put on your what you've got. It, these bags aren't the best to write on. So I have these little sticky notes. If you want to use sticky notes to put on there, but you can't put enough information on your bag because once it lives in your refrigerator, you pull it out and you go, what? What? My husband goes, what is this? What? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what is this? And why? Okay, come on up. I have one question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the fun part. <laughs> Are we going to be able to plant them outside in 60 days? So talk to Karen. Ask Karen about that one. Karen? What's that? So if we get the cold stratification for something that takes 60 days, are we going to be able to plant this outside in 60 days? No. Not likely. Um, let me think timing-wise here. I hadn't put the calendar in my head. So they would come out of the cooler or the refrigerator in the middle of August, and then it's going to take them probably another four to six weeks at least to germinate. So you're looking at September. So it's going to be a little tricky timing wise with those that require the 60 day. So the way we just germinate. And there's no way to keep those over the winter. Yeah. Well, the best thing to do would be to um, gradually, um, you know, leave them outside once they do germinate and bring them in um, if it gets too cold. If you can overwinter them um, outdoors in a protected spot, like on the east side of my house is very protected and we have real good luck overwintering stuff like this. Um, so it might be okay. Um, How would you overwinter them? Just keep them in a container or? Yeah, I would just leave them in the container. If they get big enough to transplant, then you could go ahead and transplant them and then just let them um, overwinter outdoors in a very protected spot. Could you like bury the container in the dirt or? Yes, yes, yes. And the reason for that is that to uh, the, the soil around it will insulate, help insulate and keep them from um, too drastic uh, temperature changes. So would you mulch over the top or put up? Uh... Um, depends on how big the plants get. So if it's bigger, you can mulch. What if it's tiny? Um, yeah, you'd have to take it on a case by case basis. I hate to say. Yeah. Tender seedlings, I would not do that with, but um, but Mother Nature does that routinely. You know, things will germinate in the summertime, and then do their thing and then fall comes and they magically go into dormancy and in the spring they come back. So, uh, so I'm going to add another question to this just because okay. sure. um, I'm, I'm in the midst of another project, but 
Um, what about seed bombs? Those the clay peat moss mix that that have seed seed embedded in them, and you toss them out. Tried, you... I haven't tried those. What I am trying right now is the seed mats, the mats that have seeds inside of them. Mm -hmm. They're paper. Um, I've got some outdoors, and they've been out there a week now, and they haven't done anything. Um, but um, so this is the second year I've tried the seed mats and I do not like them. They are very difficult to work with. Um, I prefer just the seed. <laughs> the seed bombs may work a little better um, if they stay put, but the problem with those is that I don't know how many seeds are in, in each one of those little balls um, and you end up with this a bunch of them all at one in one spot and uh, so I, I don't know you could try a few but I, so far I'm not terribly impressed with the seed mats mm. another question is the boiling water uh, what well, cold stratification obviously mimics freezing and thawing what what is are you trying to mimic with the boiling water how, how do the plants in nature get exposed to boiling water fire Fire. Okay. There are certain seeds. I'm not using any of them today, but it, the the best example I can think of is lodgepole pine, uh -huh. where uh, the cones won't even open unless they're exposed uh -huh. to fire. Um, and okay. so, hot water actually does occur in a lot of areas in the world, including some places in Wyoming. And uh, it's just a, what it actually does is just softens up the seed coat so that water can Oh, it's a, basically a steam bath for the seed coat. Right, exactly, yeah. Okay. Right. Hello, Karen. Hello. Hi. When these seeds are just like specks of pepper, how do you handle those? I was going to put them on the on the coffee filter so I could see them, but then how do you get transfer them to some other? That's where putting them in a mix with the growing mix, the okay. mix helps tremendously. 
That's you better. Help, and yeah, you okay. mix them in with some of the growing mix because the seeds are so tiny, they're very difficult to sow individually. Yes. And so if you put them in this, then you can do your treatment in the bag or if they need treatment, if they don't, then don't worry about it. Um, and then you can just sow the contents of the bag over the top of whatever it is that you're germinating them in. Well, that's what I was curious. What do you germinate them in then? I mean, are, well, you, are you putting yeah, them in no, cells? Just something, you, no, I would not use the plug trays. I would just use one of those clamshells or something like that. And, um, you know, just something that's an inch or two deep. You so don't then, need it to be very deep. Then, then you I'm can, waiting. You can just do it by hand and sprinkle them over the top, or it's easier to mix them in the first to get a little more even. So then I'm waiting for them to, to sprout, and then I I have to manually pick them up. And, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, right. you're going to that. Yeah. It's, with seeds that tiny, it's very difficult to sew them in a plug, plug tray. Um, I've been there, done that. It's okay. not fun. <laughs> That's so, good to know. Um, small seeds okay. are just really difficult. Okay, know. thank you. Karen? Yeah. I have been trying to get some coral bells. They were pelleted seeds to germ. I'm on my second round. Anything that I might be missing, because I've got them in the soil under uh, right now i even moved them outside to see if that would even help it yeah they'll be much happier outdoors um, but they are a shade plant so don't expose them to too much light they need high light but indirect light uh coral bells would be so actually take them out they're in the light right now would i have killed them well they haven't been 60 days now just put them under because they need light to germ so i can just stick them in a shaded area. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me hang on. I gotta find the right section right here. Okay. H E U. Okay. The suggestion is. It says light aids germination, so don't cover heavily. Um, they should germinate. It, it takes them a while. They won't be ready to transplant for. Well, I've managed days. like yeah, they're thirty days. Yeah, it takes eight or nine weeks for them to get to any size. Yeah. So, so uh, you, they're really slow. <laughs> um, and it takes them at. Plus, they require a very warm germination temperature, 70 to 75 degrees. And so okay. that, that may be holding them back as well. And okay. it takes them three weeks to germinate. Okay. So patience. <laughs> warm temperature. Well, I mean, I, I tried one round and I didn't get anything out of it. So I thought I'd try it again. And yeah, yeah. Pelleted seeds are wonderful. They make it a little easier to, to uh, handle them, but they are expensive. So. Karen? Yeah. On one of the seeds that needed um, light to germinate, I got a plant shell, put the stuff in there, and then it seems like two different plants showed up. I have them on my, I have a little garden window thing over my kitchen window. Um, one kind of looks like baby basil, and the other one looks like whatever it was. Well, I the seeds should be what says on the package unless you unless unless you got them from someone who just collects seeds or something i don't know yeah and it, sometimes well let me put it this way depending on the plant as well seeds don't necessarily look anything like their parents and they may not necessarily look anything like each other and so um, with seeds, you get a lot of variability, uh -huh. especially um, with some of our natives and some of our perennial stuff. The annuals aren't quite so bad about it, but um, you, you are not guaranteed to get identical seedlings. And the seedlings may not look anything like their parents. So there may, they may be the same 
genus, uh -huh. but they may, their genetics are gonna maybe just so different that they look very different. So you'll just have to kind of watch and see what they do, yeah. especially when they bloom. We didn't really get to talk about all that stuff, but yeah, <laughs> seeds are not, if you save seeds, you're not necessarily saving yourself any time or money or energy because the seedlings may not be anything like what you want. I might mention one other thing, and that is that with these types of seeds, natives in particular, um, you are probably not going to get 100% germination. You might be lucky to get 50. Um, a lot of our annuals and vegetables, we are bred and the quality of them is such that you can get 95% up to 100% on those. But with these types of seeds, your germination rate is not going to be nearly that high. So Karen just said that on these, on the native seeds like these, that your germination rate is going to be right around 50%, plus or minus. Unlike, you know, what we're used to with vegetable seeds where it's 95 to 100% germination, native seeds viability is going to be much less. So Karen, there's a lot of people in the Laramie County Master Gardener Group that are very excited about doing native plants. And I've got some, I've got some thinking, talking about doing a subgroup within the Master Gardeners here, uh, just on native plants and seed starting and native plant propagation. So you may see more of us here. A lot of people are interested and then figure out how difficult they really are. <laughs> So Karen, I was looking at the requirements for growing ramps. I never thought about being 
For what? Ramps, R-A-M-P-S, wild garlic. And a window well, I wonder. That's, that is, that's quite the, uh, the challenge to try to <laughs> I've never tried, so that's what I don't have any, I can't tell you anything about. It takes them like 18 months to germinate and they need like cold, they need warm, they need cold again, and then they'll germinate maybe. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Got a cool yeah. moist place. A lot of the tropical plants are difficult like that. I have a palm phoenix palm in my living room that i grew from a seed and i swear that took thing took 18 months to germinate i had completely forgotten about it and it i realized i had not looked at it for months and it finally I brought so much I don't know. I know it's a shot. And some didn't hold it like I thought it would, and it's still picking up. I don't know. 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 So seed storage is really important. And, and it's got to keep them cool or cold. And if they're in some place like a garage or a garden table, for sure. sure I've heard some of but I have tomato seeds that are 10 years so, old. They keep them in the refrigerator and they still germinate. And the same thing with corn. Yeah, I mean, what I found is that peppers don't like to be stored very long. Four years of yeah. years, onion seeds, two years of the most extra. It just doesn't breathe. Your seeds even when you went, okay. Yeah, so I store all my vegetable seeds in the crisper store in my refrigerator. Okay. I keep them all in paper. Okay. Or the original kind that they came in. I will keep them all together and put them in a in a, a plastic bag, but I never close it. Okay. I just keep them all kind of rounded up. I've had them in. I put. I for the longest time I get mine in the freezer in the prison store, and I never had a problem. When I put them in the fridge, is when I had a problem. It's like consistent temperature. Once I kept them in the freezer, and then I saw this one gal, she had this big plastic container you can hold pictures in, and then they come in with different ones that come in. So you can get them at the and that's how she stored her seeds because they love it. And I'm like, that's a good idea. Catherine, can I throw in one, one last thing here? Sure. And that is that um, it is possible to go ahead and sow them um, seeds in a plug tray or whatever it is your final place that you're gonna germinate them in is, uh, whether it's a plug tray or a clamshell or any type of other container. 
um, go ahead and sew them. And then you can put, if you have room in your fridge or a separate um, cooling facility that's about 40 degrees, you can put that entire thing into the cooler covered and then just spritz it every once in a while with some water to keep them moist. And then after the stratification time, then you can pull them out and they're already in their germination place. <laughs> and so, but you have to have more space for that. If you're using, you know, the small bags like this, which is what I've done for stratification this time around, usually I go ahead and sew them in the cell in the plug trays and then put the whole tray in the refrigerator. Um, but this way should work as well. So, but you need to have a lot of space in a big cooler in order to um, cool down and stratify a lot of plug trays. That always helps have that space. Yeah, most of us don't Here's in our refrigerators. Can use a sulfur for now. I was talking about, but she's got that um, the ability to burn sulfur and that's what she needs to do. So that's why it's a good thing. That's what I thought you said. The last one, get it out of there. Okay. I asked you again. The back one is good for fungus I picked up what chewing tobacco, pipe tobacco, cigarette tobacco, doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Oh, nasty. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, I found a transplant in so got one that came in spider bumps. So I thought I could have it on, so I could freeze it. Is that Donna? My grandchild. Catherine? Is yeah. that Donna? Yeah. Donna Hoffman? Hi. I thought I recognized you, but then on this screen, it's a little difficult to tell people. So, hi, how are you? <laughs> so, Karen, do you have any words of wisdom on treating spider mats? Spider mites on a house plant. <laughs> Take it outside in the shade and hose it down with water frequently, unless it's too big to move, in which case, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Um, they don't like getting wet. And so one of the easiest things to do is just wash them off if it's a small plant. If it's a large plant that can't be moved easily, there are some, um, Let's say you could use some uh, horticultural oil or horticultural soap, and especially on the undersides of the foliage. And you'll have to follow the instructions on the label of the product that you're using to determine amount of time between sprayings, et cetera. Um, but you need to find something that, will, that has a specific spider mite, miticide in it. They're hard to get rid of indoors. That took about Whatever that she just said. Yeah, I just, I just love the compost pile. All right, um, Catherine, I've got, I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have eight different species that I'm putting in the cooler this evening, right now, as soon as we sign off. Um, and they will be in the cooler for varying times depending on their stratification requirements. There are three others that I will, that don't need any treatment at all. And so I will sow those probably tomorrow or today, Tuesday, later this week, I'll get those sewn because they don't, there's three that don't require any treatment that I have. Um, and we'll go from there. We'll see what kind of success we all have. I'll be curious to hear how you all do with your germination and growing on. And I can certainly uh, let Catherine know, you know, how mine do. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that, it'll be nice to compare notes and see yeah, how things yeah. germinate. It's fun. And this kind of thing is just a hoot. It really is fun to do these kind of exercises. So, so these are going in the cooler as soon as we sign off. All right. So does anyone have any more questions for Karen on seed starting? It's, it's kind of, I'm getting a lot of questions on, well, what do I do once it germinates? Yeah. <laughs> right, and that's where it gets tricky. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is the easy part. The growing on is a little more difficult. And that is where you need much. information on each specific um, species that you're working with. And, and like I said, light is generally the limiting factor indoors. Um, if you have a greenhouse or you know some sort of a high tunnel or hoop house or something, or even a row cover um, will definitely help. Um, the only problem we have outdoors around here is animals. Um, we have to cover virtually everything in order to keep the critters out. Yes. Other than that, I, I, I have a whole like four hours of seed stuff that we could talk about, <laughs> just seeds. <laughs> um, and actually you can get an entire degree in seed science and technology. So this, we just barely scratched the surface today, but. Any other questions or issues? I, I think everybody's kind of busy, Good. you know, trying to Good. put seeds in bags or clamshells or boiling water over them. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. We do a sulfuric acid treatment on in class. It's always interesting. Well, it's a big, it's a big jump for a lot of people who just started. I've started a lot of seeds, but never sterified or stratified. Yep. So, yeah. Right. And do remember that this is basically for perennials. Um, annuals hardly ever require. You might need to soak them a little bit, but that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe Karen, we can talk about coming back and now that your seeds have germinated, now what's next? Uh huh. Sure. That might that might be a good one for a little bit towards follow the end up. of summer. Yeah, mm -hmm. follow up. Yeah, definitely. A lot of these are sixty day stratification, and then it'll take another month or two for germination. So we're probably looking at at least early October before we'd have enough results really. Some of them will germinate without any treatment, of course, but those that we have to cool are gonna be a whole different ball game, so. If it says 30 days, can we do it like 40 if we're gonna be gone? So can you do it longer than 30 days? The cold stratification? Oh, sure, yeah, you can. Yeah, usually those are minimum times um you don't want to you know overdo it but okay. yeah mother nature um stratifies things for several months often in the winter what we're doing is minim mim mimicking winter the multitasking hand sanitizer yeah <laughs> A year ago, we couldn't get enough of it. Now they can't sell it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Catherine, I'm going to sign off. Um, okay. You all know where to find me. So, absolutely. And yeah. we will invite you back once everything Great. towards the end of the, the summer, early fall, and 
Now that now that you have these seeds in your refrigerator, what do you do next? Right. Yep, exactly. So, <laughs> all right, okay. we'll we'll do that. So. Okay, Karen, right. thank care, you for everybody. your time. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.